after uh, my briefing, y'all are the press corps, you're welcome to ask me any question you want. I may or may not answer it. If uh, bad language bothers you, you might as well leave now. All right, okay. so here we go. <laughs> Sir, can we give you the G1 report? Um, our current strength is 2,600 troops short. The 5th Division is short 440. 35th Division is short 220. 79th Division short 770, 80th Division short 740, 4th Armored is short 270, and the 6th Armored is short 160. Uh, I would uh, recommend though you don't take those numbers to heart right now. We're having a little problem with our record keeping. We're getting good numbers as far as our casualties are concerned, but the replacement numbers are a little off. We're not getting proper paperwork for the new troops coming in. Okay, I'll tell you what I want you to do. We're going to start cannibalizing stuff that we don't need. I want 10% for my headquarters. You canvass them. You find out which one, which they want to volunteer and what they're good at. If they were trained in artillery, we'll put them there. If they were trained in mobilization and tanks, we'll put them there. Hell, I don't care. They're all trained in something besides being a clerk. So we'll, we're going to take 10% out of my headquarters. Now, I understand that those black soldiers are still in the brig from that race riot. I want them released and brought here. That's bullshit. They, all they were trying to do was go into the officers and the enlisted men. They were thrown out and they got in the fight. That's bullshit. I want them here. Now, the 761st of the tank battalion, it's all black, and it's in uh, uh, the States right now. They've been training for a year and a half going around a circle. They're probably the best damn trained tankers we've ever had. So you get them up here. I want them to report to duty. I'm going to put them on the right side of the 4th Army Division to get started because we really need them. Yes. Then, we've got about a thousand in jail for a bunch of stuff. They didn't salute an officer. It was a little something that was stolen and we're going to take the guy who put that up and shoot him. And uh, uh, so uh, I want those people uh, released and bring them to me. I want all 1,000 of them in front of me. I'm going to have a little talk with them. If they keep their their stuff straight, they keep their, I'll expunge their record for whatever it was they were put in jail for as long as it was minor. Don't want any serious stuff, no felonies, yes, and uh, we'll put them back in the fight. Okay, you want me to talk to General O'Hare about getting the replacements a little faster? We're working on getting everything straightened out on the paperwork. The Army's full of paperwork, also full of shit, so we'll just do the best I we can. I have to agree with you, sir. All right. Okay, uh, we'll get that replacement situation in. Okay, yes sir, continuing my report, the 90th Division has requested uh, to be brought up to overstrength of 200%. They're around Metz. They're really re getting a lot of resistance from the battalions guarding the forts around Metz. We can't make a, a division out of nothing. 100% of a replacement, you have two divisions here. What I want you to do is take that special division, the Ghost Division, I want you to put them over there and make like they're two divisions. You know which one I'm talking about, the secret yes. stuff. And then you take the 90th division and you move them on along. And I understand that there's a, a German um, garrison there at Durant that has refused to, to surrender. They're a bunch of SS soldiers, is that correct? Yes. They said they'd rather die. Well, we're going to make sure that that happens. But we will give them a little bit of chance to surrender. Take some of that German gasoline that doesn't work very well. Take it down there, tell the troops that we're going to dump it down their air slots at Durant. And we'll give them about five minutes to surrender after we light it. Okay. Right. I, I, we may have a little trouble getting our troops to wait the five minutes. I so understand. I can understand I that. understand. Well, that's okay. They want, they want to die for their country. The 90th, sure 90th has been getting beaten up pretty bad, and I've talked to their people, and they are really, really mad at the Germans. Well, good. Okay. Tell them that they're supposed to take prisoners. <laughs> All right. The last, yes, they surrender in time. Last item right. is a lot of the mail is running a little slow. Uh, we're having trouble keeping track of which soldiers are going to which units. 
so the mail is having trouble following them. We've done some checking. Some of the oldest mail we have is now 53 days old. We're getting trying to get that line shortened up. Brigadier Johnson's in charge of our mail. You tell him that we will start having mail arrive regularly and on time in two weeks. Our name is replacement. Yes, sir. We're glad to tell right. him. This concludes my report, sir. All right. Send the next one in. Okay, General. General Intelligence uh, has said that we're facing several German armies at the Bulge. Currently, we're facing uh, Army Group G under the command of General Black, who recently replaced General Blackwoods. Uh, we're also facing the 13th SS uh, Army Commander, by, uh, headed by Major General Priestess. The 89th Corps by Major General Holt, and the 82nd Corps commanded by Major General Hollins, who recently replaced Major General Sinberg. We're also facing the 48th Panzer Group commanded by Major General von Lutwitz, and the 58th Panzer Group with Major General Kluger. Uh, intelligence report that enemy strength remains high, their morale is high, and they're a little fanatical like they're hopped up on something. And uh, most notably at Fort Durham. Tell you what I want you to do. Send an intelligence detail out there and see if they can find and capture some of those people with those uh, pills that we think they're carrying. And I want them sent to the lab to find out exactly what the hell it is they're taking. Uh, now, we still have copies of all those German newsletters they send out to their own troops, don't we? Yes, sir. What I want you to do is copy one of those, make it look exactly like theirs. But I want you to put in there that in case you have an officer who is ahead of you, who is commanding you, that does something really bad, that they're allowed to shoot one every once in a while, but just keep the shooting down to a low minimum. Now, they may be goofy enough to actually do that if they read it in one of their newspapers. You never know. Yes, sir. Sounds right. like a wonderful idea. <laughs> All that right. concludes my report, sir. sir. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Oh. Got a prisoner for you, sir. <laughs> Where did he come from? One of the patrols picked him up. Not too far out of the uh, 90th area. Whose but grandpa is this? Us? <laughs> you speak English? Uh, nine. Well, the, were you on the Russian front? I thought so. We have some Russian interrogators that we have in Turkey, right? Nine, right nine, nine, nine. Now, do you speak no. English? Nick Rushish. You no, speak nine, now. Nine. You speak English. I thought nine, so. Nine, now, uh, oh, uh, American. Sir, he is a uh, Volks. Volkswagen. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Okay, how old are you? Uh, dry and sexy. Sixty. And who else is in there with you? We got some young ones, don't you? How young are they? Uh, 16. 16? Yeah. And 60 in your unit? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something. Really small. Really tall. And really old. How in the hell did you get did you conscripted into service? Yeah. Did they you fight probably, in the last war? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I, I got you. We have reports that they're, they're giving some sort of drugs to the people to keep fighting. Are, are, are you familiar with something called Pergadan or Pergagen or something like that? Mm, he's basically to the, the, the ninth and not giving that to me. Now, man, look here. Yeah. Let me show you something. We have this area surrounded. We have this other area we're fixing to attack. There's no way that you're going to win this thing. If we gave them a chance to surrender honorably, do you think your group would surrender? Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it? Uh, Waffen SS 9, but uh, my group? I'll tell you what. If we send you with a message back to your group that they'll be treated fairly according to the Geneva Convention, if you can wind up something, you send somebody back with a white flag and we'll take them in. Will you do that? Sir? Yeah. All right. Go do General, that. General, hold on just a second. Headroom? 
Admiral Lockwood's here, sir. He heard we had a prisoner. Might be. He has another prisoner. He might. We might. He might be. No, we're a, interested in this one. Naval intelligence. Why are they interested in this one? Because he might have some valuable information. On. Um, wait a minute. That act. Those barges. Right now. Yeah, on the barges. I know nothing. On the barges. <laughs> uh, those, are those Russian interrogators still out there? No. <clears throat> no. Okay. Yeah. I th well, we want to know about the barges on the Rhine. You know about those, right? And they have all the canisters in them. Oh, uh, the. Yes, yeah. If the, I the get, this is you know the admiral, right? If I give you to the admiral, will you show him where those barges are? It's that or the Russians. It's the Russians or the admiral. Uh, pick one. I know it's a hard pick. I show barges. I I show okay, barges. okay, good. Uh, and uh, take your shore patrol. Now I've offered him a deal. He'll show you the stuff. He's going to go back to his Volstrom Shore unit. Shore Patrol! Uh, I'm here! He's going to go back to his Volstrom unit, no and uh, after no you get through no with him, no and he's going to ask him to surrender and come with the white flag. If he doesn't do that, I have Russian interrogators out there. Just turn him over to him. No, no Russian. Don't do that. All right. No, 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 no. Take this prisoner. Yes, sir. General. Dr. Schnell. Appreciate it. Now! I'm glad you're here, uh -oh. and I'll tell no, you I what, when y'all get through with this little detail, I want to invite you to my mess. We have one of the finest foods, not as good as your battleships or your carriers, but it's pretty good food, and I want your, I want your sailors to be involved in it. Okay, and in recognition of that, and because you're such a great general, it's a tradition in the Navy to hand something to a general, I'm giving you a challenge plan from the U.S. Navy. Well, I'll take the challenge. Thank, Thank you so you. very much. Let's give him a hand, huh? Now, I'm going to tell you a little something. You say, why in the world is the Navy here at Patton's headquarters? He had a detachment of naval personnel. And when they crossed the different rivers, they took a lot of the landing craft with them from Normandy and put them on uh, deuce and a half. And so the Navy personnel actually helped Patton get across rivers because they were very highly trained to run those things. That's not generally known. It's in my books, by the way. Remember the ones I told you for sale? Okay, it's in there. Okay, All right. sir, next. Next. Okay, next will be your operations. Huh? Operations. Uh, morning, General, ladies and gentlemen. An operation briefing from uh, yesterday. Uh, we have been receiving heavy artillery fire in the Hickory sector near Flint. Uh, the engineers trying to work on that ridge there were forced to withdraw their equipment while Corps artillery fired 23 counter battery missions which has subdued, to a great extent, the enemy's incoming artillery fire. Comet continues to improve their bridgeheads over the Moselle. Over the past 24 hours... A little louder, Cap. You can catch that, it's yeah, and fall. Over the past 24 hours, Comet artillery fired 155 rounds of 155, 100 rounds of 8-inch howitzer, 25 rounds of 240 howitzer, uh, all at Fort Jean d'Arc. Um, the number of direct hits were made, according to our battle damage assessments, destroying two casemates and an ammo dump. Additionally, after firing 107 rounds of 155 at the shelter casemates at Fort Kellerman, the only result was chipped concrete. It doesn't, really doesn't look like anything uh, smaller than 8 inches is, is effective against their reinforced concrete structures. Over at Spitfire, Pine Tree and Gangway missions in the Mets region destroyed rail marshalling yards and other secondary military targets. Okay. Hey, what we should do? Sir. Get a hold of Opie Wyman, 19th Air Tactical Command. Uh, General Gaffey will, will help you get through to him. I want you to ask him to, to, to go ahead and get Doolittle if he'll run some of his B-17s over that area. We'll drop a few of the, those bombs on that on Mets. We shouldn't have a problem with that or, or Fort, uh, Fort Durant. Now, I understand also that the bridge is out at Nancy, the railroad bridge. That's correct. Now, let me tell you something. I talked to... Uh, I got a communication from my uh, engineer, and he said it would take three days to, to, to fix the bridge over Nancy so we can run rail in there. I've got wounded on the other side that needs to get over there. So here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, I want you to write the communique down to, to my chief engineers. I will give you uh, a chance to go talk to him. And here's what we're going to do. He said that if he, to get it done in 24 hours, he'd have to work at night. And then he said they'd have to have searchlights to light up the place. And if he did that, the Luftwaffe would fly over and they would bomb the place. 
Well, hell, we've been wanting to shoot the Luftwaffe ever since we got here. So what we're going to do is we're going to move every anti-aircraft gun we have down there by that bridge. Then we're going to take all the searchlights we got down there out of that bridge. And when them silly son of a bitches fly over, we're going to have us a damn fine hinkle shoot. And you tell him that bridge will be done in 24 hours or he'll have to name a replacement. Yes, sir. All right, and that's how we'll take care of that. Now, the ammunition and other problems, we'll get, we'll get the wounded to Paris. Yes, Once they're there, we'll hook up more trains, more cars of the thing. They've got enough ammunition, enough, enough of the blankets and stuff to take care of. We'll put them on it and bring them back. We'll drop them off at headquarters. We'll take some more wounded, and we'll just run us a little railroad train back and forth. All right. Thank you, sir. That concludes my briefing. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I'm done. Thank you, sir. Sir? Sir? Heard you were coming. What's your report? Captain Poland, 51st Field Hospital. No, sorry, sir. All right, walking wounded, 174. Return to duty of those walking wounded, 24. Casualties, 10. Waiting to evacuate by train or ambulance, 68. Also, syphilis is running rampant. Our blood, si blood supply is exhausted. Our rations are nearly exhausted. We are exhausted. Hey, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna hit each one of those things. I've got 70 ambulances I'm sending your way. I want your nurses to jump onto them. We're going to load those wounded up. By the time you get back, the train will be ready to go across to Nancy. And when we, when we get you ladies to Paris, after you get the, our troops situated in the hospitals in Paris, I'm going to give you all a three-day pass. Now, the syphilis and the venereal diseases, we're going to take care of that. Uh, Nancy, as you well know, was an open town. Yes, sir. The, the Nazis have been there. They didn't destroy the place. But we got more whorehouses than we have places to drink. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my MPs in there. And we're going to make sure that the signs are put out. The Red Cross said they put the signs out with the GI 45. And we're going to give those troops um, rubbers so that they don't catch diseases. And we're going to keep it down that way. I've told the, the, the operators of these houses that as long as they treat my soldiers properly, they don't overcharge them and they don't roll them in the back as, as, as had happened before, we'll leave those places open. But the first time any of my troops are hurt, I'll close the place down, put them in the brig. That's the best I can do. I wish they didn't do those kinds of things, but I can't stop them. I can't lose any more people from syphilis. So you'll make sure our Red Cross and our Red Cross girls have got the orders down to make sure that, that these men know so when they take an R&R &R and Nancy, at least they come back without some sort of oddball disease. Yes, I don't like it. I think it's uh, a bad thing, but this is war and soldiers are soldiers. Yes, so uh, if when you get back from Paris, I want you to give me a report. Will you do that for me? Will do. All right. Thank you, sir. You. That, by the way, actually happened. He was there. I was there. He was there. He was there. Did they give you a GI-45 to make sure? <laughs> How many there? How many? How long were you there? You want to tell some stories you haven't told? <laughs> we were outside in Nancy, you know, and they gave us an IR to go down there, you know. And there was uh, two, three blocks guys lining up going into the cat house. Not a whole house. Cat house, we used to call it. Cat what house? Cat, 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 cat house. house. Yeah. Cat house. Yeah. yeah. Not whore house. But we went in there and a bunch of young ladies, you know. <laughs> now you thought I was kidding, this guy's there! <laughs> and they just be walking in and there, you know, and they guys would pick up the skirt to look at it. Yeah, to make sure it wasn't a dirty leg. <laughs> you know, this is getting more adult than it is, right? <laughs> You know, I, I'm going to tell y'all a true story. Syphilis in, in, and uh, transmitted diseases were really a problem. And, and if you contracted that, you were put in a hospital, you were not allowed to leave, and they had a series of shots that they gave you. 
And if you left without taking the series of shot and they captured you, they brought you back and you had to take the series of shot again, and they were extremely painful. Uh, what, what he did in Nancy, France, he, he established, he didn't establish the four houses, but he let them run, cat houses as he calls them. And I was invited to uh, Patton's uh, hospital where he died uh, for the 64th anniversary of his death. And one of the soldiers there said, would you like to see something still in operation that Patton set up? I said, well, sure. So he took me to a place in, in, in Heidelberg, and there was a, a, a building there, and it had little red lights. I says, what's that? He says, that's Patton's whorehouse. I says, you're kidding. And it was still in operation, and they still ran it the same way he set it up all these years, because it was a way to keep people from catching diseases and taking them home. Now, I don't agree with that morally, but it's a fact. So he's telling the truth. It, 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 that's what that's what they did. He had the lowest rate of, of transmitted diseases of any army. Uh, Third Army had the lowest uh, rate by statistics. So it worked. He was a pra he was a, he was a man who said, "I can't stop it, but I can regulate it," and that's what he did. Next. General, sir. Yes. Perilous uh, weather conditions have precluded any Spitfire cover for cargo aircraft that were coming in overshot the drop zone at Etain. One was shot down by the Germans, the other three were lost. Of the 20,000 litters, or 20,000 <coughs> blankets, 10,000 litters and 375 cil oxygen cylinders, Lucky reported that he got 2,500 blankets thousand litters and 100 oxygen cylinders. Eagle reports to me that, that transporting uh, priorities are ammunition, food, and oil. Hey, what we're going to do? We've discussed it. We're going we're gonna to tie in what you need with Red Ball Express. We can, great, we can get the fuel in there. We have a trucking company who has managed to get some extra gasoline that I can't disclose where it came from, but it came. Um, when the train gets from Nancy to Paris, it's there not far from General Lee in the SOS, the supply of, of demand. So we're going to do that and we'll add some extra train uh, cars and we'll bring those blankets, and especially those oxygen cylinders back. So you'll make a note of that. You'll give it to our supply officer, Eklin, in the rear echelon of all the lists that I've told you and your list that you have and tell him it's a direct order from me to make that happen. Yes, sir. All right. You're dismissed. Sir? Yes. Your favorite ladies are here now to see you. Oh, the, the uh, Sergeant Snipe Press Corps. I'm so excited. <laughs> you know, the last time you were here, you asked some pretty interesting questions. I, I understand you have some more questions well, for me. Well, we'll see what we can do, sir. Uh, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> you realize that, that the wrong information gets out, and Ike gets really pissed at me? Well, there's always the option of off the record. We can do that. <laughs> what you got? Well, on the record, sir, we've been hearing about Eisenhower reallocating your fuel supplies to Monty. How, do, how will you be addressing the fuel shortages <laughs> resulting from that? You want the truth or what I'll tell you? How about both? <coughs> I'll tell you the truth, but you can't, you can't repeat it. I can work with that, sir. I had a black trucking company who felt really bad about us not having the gas. So they put on 12th Army Group patches. They changed the, the, the markings on their um, uh, trucks and then they got the papers and they forged them and they went into Bradley's gasoline dump and came back with the gasoline. Well, that's but you can't way. print that. <laughs> I'm going to give them the bronze star for it, but i got to wait till they do something else. Uh, so that's how I'm going to solve part of the problem. The, the, the official problem that I'm going to give you is that we're, we've set up the Red Ball Express. And they're going to be a group of truckers that are going to run 24-7, and they're going to go in from at Normandy, where a lot of the gas it is, and they're going to bring it back. We've also got C-47s that are going to bring the gasoline in, and we're going to supply our tanks. Now, as far as Monty getting the gas and using it, God damn it, if they'd give me the gas, I'd go all the way to Berlin and shoot that paper hanging son of a bitch. But since it gets the money, he's going to roar with a big roar and tidy up the battlefield. I don't expect him there until next winter. 
Well, speaking of... But I can't say that. <laughs> off the record, Yes, certainly. that's off the record. Speaking of Monty, what did you think of his Operation Market Garden? How would you have done things differently? I'd have put somebody in charge that could have done it. <laughs> Meaning you, I'm guessing. Of course. But uh, they put Monty, you know, that's politics, you know. Montgomery wanted to make the splash and make the newspapers. And he made a splash and he made the newspapers, but not quite the way he wanted to do it. And we lost some very good men. Yeah. Sorry to hear that, But sir. you can't put that in there either. All right, all right. So, on the record then, we've been seeing some bad weather lately. How's that been impacting your tactics? It has been impacting, but I tell you what, I've called my chaplain in, Chaplain O'Neill, and I've asked him to, to make a weather prayer. Now, I stand in good with the Lord, and I told him that if he made a good prayer, that the Lord would listen and we'd have good weather. So he's in the process of taking that on. And I've also told him that I want our troops to pray some more. So we've issued order number five, which allows them when they go to church services, that they're gonna stop and let the soldiers pray. Because usually they have a year's idea to stand up and sit down, they stand up and sit down, pray. the priest prays a little bit and they go home. We're not doing that. We're gonna let them actually pray. And I think that's gonna make a difference. Uh, the Almighty's gonna hear our prayers. See, we've had, all the other armies that have gone through here have had pestilence and they've had diseases from, from you know, William the Conqueror to the Romans, but we haven't had that. And the reason we haven't had that is that our troops are being prayed for by their, by their families and their, back at home. So I figured it was important that we also pray and ask, because the Bible says you have not if you don't ask, but we're going to ask, and that's why we're going to do it. So you can put that in there. Will do. All right, well... For the record, sir, is there anything else you want the people out there to know? You tell them that we have the finding, finest fighting force in the world, and we're going to go all the way to Germany, and I'm personally going to shoot that paper-hanging son of a bitch myself. <laughs> My pleasure to be able to report that. Thank you so much all for right, your time, Y'all have sir. a great day. But I just told you was the truth. That actually happened. That concludes the briefing for today. The press may ask questions of General Patton at this time. Um, you learned something, didn't you? You, did, you hadn't heard about the prayer, and especially about praying. Patton was a Christian, and he, it's hard to think of him as that because of all of his language. But he used, he didn't care. He grew up using foul language, and that's what he was going to use. Now, we're going to have questions and answers. I know there's so much questions about Pat. What, what's the uh, G1, G, what does the G stand for? G1, G2? General Staff, sir. Oh, Anything general with a general G staff. is a general staff. Anything with an S, that's like a platoon, company, battalion, regiment. Anything commanded by a general officer would be a G. Okay. Good question. Next. Yes, sir. For fatality rates, what was the comparison between actual battlefield fatalities and disease? It, it depended on the army and it depended on the time. Uh, because if they were in a town that had not been destroyed, they had R&R &R and, and they had a chance of catching diseases. I mean, th these women would climb into sack for, a, you know, a little food or, you know, candy bar. So, and the diseases were really strong. And the rest of it, the, the, the problem they had was trench foot and they had, they got, got a lot of coals and it was wet. It rained and it rained and it rained. In fact, during the Lorraine campaign, that was what made him want to have that prayer for weather because it was raining all the time and it was getting colder. And the, and the troops were cold and they were catching diseases and colds and things because they would just run rapid to the camp because they were in close proximity. In a, in a, in a pup tent was designed for two people, okay? One, two men. And if you're that close and you one of them catches something, you're going to catch it too. So, the, so that was a, a big problem. Uh, but Patton, as far as battlefield casualties, though he had a lot, he had fewer than most because he kept attacking. And the more you attack and the more Germans you kill, the less they have left to attack you. Thank you. Next question. What, yes. What are the casualties on both sides? What about the casualties? How many? How many were there on both sides? It varies. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, by March of um, 1945, he had captured almost a million Germans. Captured. So you can imagine how many he killed. You know, I have any. Numbers. Not good statistics, no. And back then, and they quit, and they quit it later. Uh, they were taking places. They were gaining land. They were. They were going places. So the casualties were 
were not. Sometimes they'd get off a battlefield and they decimated the unit. They didn't go through and count them. Uh, only when they got around to grave registration or how many they buried did they know actually how many they killed. And when you had to, what you what you had was was carpet bombing. So the B-17s would fly over sometimes a thousand at a time, and they would bomb where the Germans were. You can imagine that they're just bits and pieces. So, so German casualties were very hard to calculate. We knew how many we had lost. Next question. Yes. Horses. Talk about the horses. Oh, the Lippizzaner horses. Um, um, do, toward the end of the war, uh, Patton got information that the Lippizzaner horses, which was a very rare old breed of horses, had been captured by the Germans and being held. And uh, one of his uh, cavalry. Uh, groups which had actually been horse cavalry before the war uh, got wind of it and they gave him the information and said these beautiful horses have a chance to be captured by the Russians. The Russians would have ate them. So they said we're going to have to try to save them and Patton agreed. So the group, the problem was is getting to the horses you had to get through an SS unit that didn't want you to have the horses. So they knew they'd have a fight to get to the people, to the soldiers who had the horses who didn't want to fight anymore and they wanted to surrender. And they're the ones who told our allied troops where the horses were and how many they were. There's over a thousand of them. And it wasn't just the Lipizzaner horses, there were other breeds of horses that were there. So uh, they took, uh, it was called Operation Cowboy of all things. And they took their deuce and a half and they set them where they could run the horses up into the back of the deuce and a half. And uh, they, they did have a battle with the SS, they decimated them. And to save face, the, the group that had the horses, they said, well, we're going to have to put up a fight. So they ran out and went, bang, 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 that's our fight, and then we surrender. And uh, they got the horses. And imagine, in World War II, over a thousand horses, some of them on uh, deuce and a half, some of them being herded like you would uh, 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 wild horses, traveling through Czechoslovakia and into Germany to, uh, to bring back it was quite a show. Now, there's a movie that was made several years ago called uh, Miracle of the Stallion by Walt Disney. It's about as close as you're going to actually see as to what they, they lived at, uh, they, they, uh, they did. But, to this day, if you go see the Lipizzaner horses when they perform in the States, they make mention of how they were saved by General Patton's Third Army. So, did that answer your question? And in my books, I have pictures of the Lipizzana horses <coughs> being saved, and I have the story of how it took place. Because like I say, it's every day of the war, so we get to the last part of it. And that was in the very last part of the war. And now, another thing about the Lipizzana horses is that they were they did quite a show. And so when the when Third Army was, was set down after the war, waiting to see if it would go to the Pacific, the soldiers had very little to do. And they were invited to go to the horse shows. And they went to the Lipizzaner horse shows and they traveled all over Europe and had souvenirs. Didn't know that part of it though, did you? Next, next question. That's a good question. Yes, sir. If uh, Washington allows you to take on the Soviet Union, do you think you, do, you can defeat Marshal Zukov, the Soviet military? What was the first part of the question? If Washington allows you to take on the Soviets, do you think you can defeat Marshal Zukov? Do we, to, did Patton want to take on the Soviets? Is that what you're asking? Yes, he, he, not only take them on, he can defeat them. What, are you going to defeat them? Yes and no. Okay? Let me explain that and so you'll understand. The Soviets had a, a, a terrible supply line and they, by the time they got to Berlin, they, they were running low. However, there was many of them, thousands, millions of them. We did not have the political willpower in America to have a two-front war. The two-front would have been the Russians and the Japanese. They knew they were going to have a million casualties if they had to invade uh, Japan. That's, that was the reason for the atomic bombs. And we had to use the troops that were in Europe in order to move them over to fight the Japanese. If we had started a fight with the Russians, we wouldn't have had the troops. There just weren't that many. Russia had millions of them, and they were fierce fighters. If we had sent our army just then to fight the Russians, Patton could have defeated them probably, but he didn't have the support and the logistics it took because we're going to the other side. And when it was brought up, and it was brought up in the Pentagon when Marshall discussed about the Russians, and they decided to leave it alone. 
And that's exactly what they did. And it was much to patent's chagrin because they thought there was a bunch of mongrels and they would go, they, when they went into Berlin, they raped every, every female they could find in restitution for when the uh, Germans had been going into Russia and killing all the people and murdering them that they did. So they came back around and did the same thing to them, tit for tat. And it, it wasn't a pretty sight. And they would, uh, you can see some of the newsreels for the women were just raped, some of them raped to death by the Russians. And Patton just hated the Russians with a passion. But there was nothing he could do. Next question. Come on, you guys have got, y'all over, over here. Just out of plain curiosity, how would you done Parker Garden differently than Montgomery? How would I have prosecuted the war with Mag oh, without man. Montgomery? Uh, 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 Garden. You said that he did a horrible Well, first thing. of all, Market Garden was poorly planned. The radios didn't mesh with each other. He didn't do his intelligence. He didn't understand that there was a second German SS uh, division there, and they should have known that. He, he got out too far and continued to go when he couldn't support the troops that he had and they got them bottled up and they got them captured. Patton would never have done any of that. Uh, he would have known what was there and when it was there. You gotta understand, the idea was behind the Operation Market Garden was to push and make a, a big line across there and cut them off from him going to, from, from, the, from uh, the Germans having Antwerp. And, to, and if he had done that, he thought he could ruin their supply line. But it was a political move, more so than it was a military move and because of the way that it was planned, it failed. And uh, Montgomery failed in Operation Market Garden. He failed in Operation Goodwood. He failed in, in taking Con in five or 10 or 15 or 20 days. When he did take Con, there was another SS unit there he didn't even know about. Uh, there was all kinds of things that the man did. And he pissed Eisenhower off so bad that Eisenhower had prepared a letter to go to um, Marshall and the president said either Montgomery goes or I go. That's from Eisenhower. And Eisenhower's, uh, uh, Montgomery's chief of staff happened to be in Eisenhower's headquarters at the time and he got back into the snow and went back and told, uh, and told Monty he'd overplayed his hand and Monty backed off from, from criticizing Eisenhower. But if, if Eisenhower had sent that letter, Monty would have been history. So what they did is they kept the the British command, the 21st Army Group, which was which was the Canadians and the British and the Ninth, an American Ninth Army, until they crossed the Rhine River. Then Eisenhower took the American Ninth Army away and left Montgomery up at the top. But Eisenhower was pissed at him, and he put the Ninth Army back to the 12th Army Group. And then Patton was turned loose to go down the Audubon, take a right through Orendorf, and all the way down to Czechoslovakia. That's the real history. Didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. The next question, yes. Patton's death, how did he die? The true story behind his death. His death. How did he die? Patton's death. Oh, the yes. true story behind Patton's death, okay. I always get this. How many of you know, how many have heard that he was murdered? Murder conspiracy. How many think he died of natural causes from the accident? Low speed car crash. Yeah, okay, that's what happened. And what, I, I'll go through it, I'll try to go through it quickly. Um, he was mad, Patton was, he's going to resign. Not retired, but resigned from the Army. And he had one day left. They said, you want to go pheasant hunting? Uh, General Keyes and General uh, Hobart Gay said, why don't you go pheasant hunting and get your mind off of it? So they're going to go to Man Mannheim to go pheasant. They didn't know they were going until that night and they made up their mind. Horace Woodering was his driver and he got into the uh, uh, back from partying that night very late and he gets up at like five o'clock in the morning and he gets a call says, Patton's going pheasant hunting and get the Cadillac. Now, he didn't know where he was going when he got into the Cadillac, had no idea. And they said, we're going to go to Mannheim. Well, going to Mannheim was not an easy thing. It was cold and it was wet and they went down an Autobahn. They stopped at a castle to look at some ruins that he wanted to see. Now, the timing of this is important. So they didn't know when they were going to go to get, arrive at Mannheim. And, and then they got stopped by MPs and he was the highest ranking officer in the European theater at the time. Patton was four-star general. He was the highest rank, had the seniority. He was in charge of Europe, basically. So they, they saluted, they, they checked his ID, and he let him go. When they get to Mannheim, Mannheim had been bombed. So there was bulldozers all over Mannheim that was moving rubble around to try to clear roads. So they didn't have a clear path anywhere they wanted to go in Mannheim. So they waved, went this way, went that way, 
and they came up to a railroad track and on the other side of it was an army ordnance depot. There was a driver in a deuce and a half and his name was Thompson. Now this stuff is known, this is not unknown stuff. And Thompson went to make a left hand turn into the ordnance depot just as Patton's car was going over the railroad track. Patton had been sitting up in the back seat real very close and the car's hit at about 30 miles an hour or less. And it pushed Patton's head into this plexiglass rim, cut him all the way to the bone and broke his neck. He fell back and Hap Gay was in the back seat with him. He says, Hap, I think I'm paralyzed, move my fingers. And, Pat, and Hap Gay did, he said, go ahead and move my fingers. And he says, I am moving your fingers. So he knew he was paralyzed and he knew it was an accident, he could talk. And the MPs had heard the accident they came up, they flagged down an ambulance. This was all within a few minutes, this is a very few minutes. And they put him in the ambulance to take him. He said, do not charge, told the MPs, do not charge that man with the accident. It was an accident, pure and simple. They're gonna to try to crucify that guy. And he had nothing to do with this accident. We, we were blinded and he turned in front and said, leave him alone. Now, a general, the highest ranking general in the European theater, and General Patton, when he gives an order, it's followed. So the MPs made a few notes, but they didn't charge the guy. Now Thompson, for the rest of his life, regretted having caused that accident. So does Horace Woody. And there's newspaper reports about him talking about it. Anyway, so they get to uh, the hospital. They realize that, that he's paralyzed. They move a X-ray, a big X-ray machine down. They cut his uniform off and they X-ray him and they see for sure that, it, that he has an injury that would normally kill somebody. So they did not expect him to live. But he had a little twitch in his leg, and so they put him in bed, and they put Crutchfield devices, which are hooks, and they put the hooks inside of his bone, and they stretched him out, hoping that there was just some chance that he wasn't completely paralyzed. They kind of knew he was. Then they called General Spur uh, Colonel Sperling from the States, who was the best uh, man in that particular department, uh, of, and they brought him back, and he brought is what uh, Patton's wife Beatrice. Now Patton was, had people in his hospital room 24 seven. He was never ever left alone. And the general who run the hospital cordoned it off with MPs. No one was allowed in, nobody was allowed in except Patton's wife and the general and one other and the surgeons. And so he lingered from the, 20, from the 9th of December, the 11th of December, whenever it was, until the 21st, and then Beatrice was reading with, reading one day. Now, what else happened? They wanted him to die in the States. So they put a plaster cast on him all the way up like this. And uh, he was prone to cough and he was prone to aneurysms and stuff like that. And they wanted, they were gonna take him back to the United States so he could die there. They knew he was going to die. It wasn't a question of maybe. And on the 21st, she was reading to him He's tired, he goes to sleep, she gets about halfway down the hallway and the nurse calls her and says, I don't think he's breathing. And he passed away. And she knew why, how he died. There was no question, there was no reason for an autopsy. The original medical files are still with the U.S. Army. It still has the x-rays and the fracture. And no one questioned up for about 20 years that he was actually died of the accident and then people began to say stuff that uh, one of them was said that Jim Donovan paid ten thousand dollars to have him killed because he knew too much on Eisenhower that was, he was drunk he was an OS, OSS officer who said that and General Donovan of course didn't do that he was a Medal of Honor winner and uh, uh, head of the OSS and good friends of Patton then there was a brass target the movie that came out where they shot Patton in the back of the head with a little rubber dart and that was played by Kennedy and then O'Reilly comes with his baloney. And, uh, and what happens is each one of these conspiracy things leaves out key parts. So if you leave out a key part of the truth, what have you told? A lie. So the, fam the Patton family, I know uh, George Patton Waters, uh, he's a grandson, a friend of mine on Helen Patton. They all agree. Baseball. He died and, and of, of, of the injuries. That was it. So when, now, I always tell you where I get my information. I don't want you just to think this is a talking head who's making up stuff. There's a fantastic book written right after the war called The Last Days of Patton by Ladislaw Farago. 
and it goes in detail as to what happened to Patton. Then there was a, a made-for-TV movie starring George T. Scott from the last days of Patton. It's called that, and that's the most accurate depiction that you'll ever read of what actually happened to Patton. They have him in the Crutchfield devices. They have him in the cast. So he died terribly. A, a great American hero, and he died of a car accident. Probably the best thing that would have happened to him for a legend because he didn't come back and tell bad stories, and we think of him as the great commander in the field that he was. As But he was a human being, and he made mistakes. And I want you to think about all the mistakes you've made in your life and all the things you wish you could do over again that, and do it differently. Patton was no different than that. Every time he gave an order, he wondered whether that was the right order. And when they came back and he had, all these people were killed because of his order, he would sit down there sometimes in tears and write letters home to the family. And he told them in, uh, when he was here selling bonds, he says, I have given the orders that got these people killed. And thank God we had people like that who were willing to go knowing out and fight that they would be killed in battle. And when he said that, Patton was in tears. That's how bad he bothered him. That's another thing that people don't know about the famous general, is that he, he too grieved for the people he had to send to, to go fight and die. Because that's a tough place to be in, to give orders that you know that the people aren't coming back when you give the orders and you have no choice. And that's what he said. And he said, I know we have a lot of dead heroes. We've also got some live heroes too, let's honor them. And uh, so that was what he said at Market Garden when he was selling bonds. Next question. Didn't know about that, about Patton that way, did you? Uh, that he would cry and it would bother him. But he, it did, yes. Who were the top five military leaders Patton admired the most? Uh, General Lee was one of them. William the Conqueror was another. Um, he had another couple of, of generals in the Civil War that he thought highly of. One of them was the uh, Grey Ghost. The other one was um, uh, the Confederate Cavalry General. His name will come to me in a minute. Uh, remember, his family had Confederate generals and Confederates in his history. And, and he knew a lot of, not General Lee, but he knew a lot of the Confederates that had fought because they were clients of his father after the war, after the Civil War, because his father was an attorney. General Mosby came and he admired him as well. So those, you know, these were people he knew about. And, and that's why he admired their battle, and he studied them in West Point. It, during the time Patton was in West Point, they studied both the Confederate generals and the uh, uh, Union generals. Let me tell you something. When the, when the war, Civil War was over, after Reconstruction, the United States Army brought in to the uh, veterans, the Confederate soldiers, and they all got pensions. All got pensions. Confederate soldiers. And General Wheeler, who had been a Confederate cavalryman, was called back to service in the Spanish-American War as a major general in the United States Army and fought valiantly in the Spanish-American War. Our country forgave the Confederacy and the soldiers and brought them back and forgave the war. This crap that we have today about honoring our soldiers, these were Americans who were fighting and they, they died vindicated by the United States. And when we think of our veterans, they're just as much veterans on the one side as they are the other. This revision of history is absolutely wrong. You tell history exactly as it was. You let the chips fall where they're gonna fall. We did bad things, we did good things. You just tell it. Because if you know the bad things, you know you're not gonna wanna repeat them later. But if you erase it and say it didn't exist, you're going to have a generation that don't know. Right now, when you see all these soldiers and all these people out here, these reenactors, they bought that equipment themselves. They came out and they teach the history themselves. And they want the young people to know what the real history of America is like. Both, and the Germans tell the story of how they fought. And we've got Italians and Russians and everything else out here. So that's what these history things are about. They get more history here than they do in school. And that's a shame. That needs to change. You can make it change. Next question. Anybody else? 
I've enjoyed you coming out. You've been wonderful. General, Thank you. Now.